All right, COVID has appropriately fried my brain like an egg. And I'm gonna use my last brain cell to talk to y'all about Elden John, who is an NPC who is not referenced in any of the in-game text. And I'm also going to try to build a case as to why he's one of the most important characters in Elden Ring, especially when it comes to understanding the central conflict and the setting of Elden Ring. Um, my communities become obsessed with this man for many reasons. It first started off because a lot of us were kind of jokingly comparing him to Moses with his two tablets. Um, we thought he was some sort of prophet figure, perhaps one of the Crucible era, because um, the omen born like to worship him. This is a sanguine noble down in the Mogwin Palace who is doing a little prayer with his Albanorc boys. Um, there's also this imagery that he has with tree roots and also um, a branching tree. And sometimes he's depicted as coming out of it. This is the Belfry Tower outside of Lyrnia. Um, and on the back side of the Belfry Tower, there is a funny little skull. I didn't get a picture of it, but it very much looks like the Memento Mori kind of um, iconography where it's reminding you, the viewer, of your mortality, your death. You will die. Um, life does end. And that's just the reality of things. That's, that's the, that's live every day like it's your last, babes. That's kind of the vibe that Elton John has. He likes to remind us of those things. And it doesn't really end with that little skull. It, it also has to do with the fact that he's depicted down in the Grand Cloister by the um, pests who follow the God of Rot, where the God of Rot was sealed. Um, he's also worshipped by ancestral followers who love the cycle of life and death, and they actually sacrifice members of their own group um, who are weaker or who don't bud horns to the ancestral followers. Or sorry, the ancestral spirits. <laughs> the ancestral followers give their weaker people to the ancestral spirits. Um, budding is seen as like budding horns, budding little leaves, little trees is seen as like a holy thing. For those of you that um, aren't familiar with Norse mythology, there are uh, stags, ancient stags that will chew on the branches of the world tree and when they crane their heads back um water spills out like the celestial dew the celestial water spills out of their horns and creates like this this pure water that um fills all the rivers that run down by the yggdrasil's tree roots so the spirit of the soul in elden ring creates this kind of like celestial life force for trees to grow, which is why the buds are are turning into little leaves, little tree branches. Um, and it seems like the ancestral spirits are incredibly important for the process of entropy, for the process of life and death. And um, the death right birds also play a part in this. Also, thank you, Vati, for pointing this out to me. But the ancestral tools that they use, like the ancestral followers, use these like ritual axes to, um, you know, do sacrifices and the ritual axes look quite a bit like the death right bird wings wow so we have like a pretty strong and also the color purple um for those of you that don't know grave violets are ritualistic flowers used for necromancy and it's the original hue of ghost flame so before there was black ghost flame there was this purple ghost flame so purple is kind of associated with the color of death so we have like the death right bird wing Oop. we have the death right bird wing imagery with the color purple or the color of death, or the gloam, the gloam color, the color of twilight. Um, so yeah, why is this fucking important? Why? So Elden John is associated with death. He's associated with rot and entropy, and there's something else going on here. The tarnished archaeologist point out, pointed out in one of his videos that there is a tablet by his foot. Now, Initially, my followers, we were all kind of joking, he's a prophet, he's like Moses, he has two tablets. Um, one of these tablets is a map of Babylon, which is like the first instance of um, trigonometry used in human history. And Babylon was uh, one of the later civilizations in Mesopotamia that came after um, Ur or Sumer, um, which had the first written alphabet in human history. And this is actually really important, like the, the establishment of the alphabet and the establishment of mathematics, because the ancestral followers um, disdain from mathematics and language. They're trying to get back in touch with um, like an era of human history that predates 
kind of like the the exit of the Dark Ages. And we consider the Dark Ages an era in which there isn't language or literacy. The reason why we do this, um, you know, like in in archaeology or or in history is because we're referring to um, a time in which archaeologists or historians don't have visibility on what's going on. So there can be, I made a joke about how like the Dark Ages is when human humans are dumb. I wasn't saying that in the literal sense. I was saying that in the sense of how Miyazaki refers to the Dark Ages in um, Elden Ring, because he refers to these Dark Ages as an age without intelligence, um, which is, you know, that's, it's quite silly. It's quite silly, but I don't think that Miyazaki felt that way either. I don't think that he was like, oh, people back then were dumb. I don't I don't think that's how it was. Um, in fact, I feel like a lot of the pagan type civilizations or the kind of beast type races have a degree of spiritual knowledge that we are disconnected from. And I'm going to get to why I feel that way um, later, later in this video essay, <laughs> in this video podcast. I'm in my video game podcast era, please. Let me let me finish. Um, so born partially of devolution. Whoa, what the what the heck? What did I do? What did I do? Born partially of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. So this is referring to aspects of the crucible or um, an era in which all life was blended together. And as you can see, our our boys, the Misbegotten, have snake's tails, and they have wolf features, they have bird features, they have all these different, um, like, animal-type features. We have the singing furies, or the harpies, or the sirens, or whatever you want to call them, um, lamenting about an age-long past that uh, predated the Age of Gold, talking about how, um, you know, the Golden One has, has forsaken, or has, has kind of taken over, and their age is lost. It's no longer their age anymore. Um, and the ancestral followers also sing to one another and play instruments and dance. And it seems like a lot of their history and their spiritual practices are oral. So it's not to say that there's not intelligence or spirituality, but rather that there is definitely a divergence in the ways that um, these cultures express their spirituality and express their art and express a bunch of stuff. In fact, one of my favorite fun facts is that during the Dark Ages of Greece, when we didn't have literacy for 300 years after the fall of Mycenaean culture, is that we actually followed much of um, Greek history through pots. There is a whole study of Greek pots um, to understand the history of, and the culture of Greece during the Dark Ages when, when language was lost. Um, so thank you, POTS. But um, POTS helped us have insight into uh, utilitarianism, like tools, but also art, spirituality, and burial rites. Pot shards were commonly buried with people, and um, POTS were used during burial rites. So that's really exciting, cool, neat. Love to see it. Um, but as Greek culture advanced and they started to develop language again, we started to see a shift in philosophy and art and spirituality again, um, specifically with with some of the some of the big philosophers that we all learn about in, you know, our civics classes in high school, uh, or like our, our ancient history classes. But let me back up um, real quick. So there was a guy named Her Herodotus, Herodotus, Herodotus. This guy I actually didn't know about. Um, I knew about Plato and dualism, about how he like established, uh, you know, there's like the body and the soul and like there's two aspects of the self, and blah, 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 blah. Um, Aristotle was the first dude who investigated light and the four elements and how color worked. Um, he was championed by Isaac Newton, who I'll talk about later. Uh, Socrates was really critical about spirituality, and he wanted to link the soul, the human soul, to the divine, and he wanted to turn away from the worship of the pantheon. A lot of critics of the pantheon or of polytheistic religions were sick and tired of emperors and tyrants inserting themselves into their own religious doctrine. So for example, say I was the ruler of Rome and there was the existing Roman pantheon, I could easily insert myself as the god of, of you know, I could be the god. Why not, you know? 
There's more than one god, so I can be... It's me. It's my era now. I get to be... I get to be the god. Um, a lot of philosophers and, and, and uh, you know, artists and people who are critical of the government fucking hated that. Rightfully so. It, it makes sense. It's understandable why they would why they would disdain that. But um, Herodotus, however you say this man's name, is really interesting to me um, because one of the things I heard a lot while I was making my videos uh, were people saying, hey, this is an Egyptian reference. This is Egyptian mythology reference. This is Egyptian. And I would sit there staring at the material, all the artistic material, and would be like, none of this looks Egyptian to me. Literally none of this looks like Egyptian art to me. I don't understand where you're coming from. And I feel like a fucking dumbass because this makes total sense. Um, but Herodotus did something called Interpretatio Greca, which is the practice of taking gods, um, stories, religions, spirituality, whatever, from other cultures, specifically Egyptian culture, and comparing them or finding like the spiritual allegories in Greek culture. And they were doing this to try to understand, um, you know, other cultures. So for example, the god Thoth, he was a scribe for the gods. He would, um, he would write down little messages, little messages between, between the gods. He would uh, study science and an early concept of chemistry called chem, or like early uh, blah, 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 early version of alchemy called chem. And he was very smart. He was the boy. He was he was the guy. Um, and during you know the Greeks' attempt at understanding the pan the Egyptian pantheon, they equated him to Hermes um, or Mercury in the Greek the Greek pantheon. So this gave birth to the legend of Hermes Trismegistus or Hermes the, Thi the Thrice Great. And there are a bunch of like really crazy legends and tall tales about Hermes Trismegistus. Like he's conflated with Moses. He's conflated with um, Akhenaten, Akhenaten, the pharaoh who's King Tut's father um, because Akhenaten brought around monotheism he is considered to be like this keeper of esoteric secrets. He knows how to create the Philosopher's Stone, a material that's able to give immortality and cure any ailment. He is, um, you know, he's like, he's the boy. He's the guy. He's the big dude. Um, he taught science to everybody. He taught, he taught mathematics to Pythagoria, Pythagoras, Pythagorean? I know it's Pythagorean theorem, but how do you say his name? Is it Pythagoras? Pythagoras? He taught it to that guy. He taught math to everybody. He works, he's my cool uncle who works at Nintendo and he tells me all the secrets. You know, like that's the kind of guy, you could literally say it, you can make up any fun fact about history and then just say that Hermes Trismegistus did it and then it would be accurate. Um, that's how this works. But also he's kind of just like the amalgam of a bunch of philosophers and um, early scientists between the Greek and Egyptian period. I'm just being a goofball. I'm not saying that seriously in terms of like him working at Nintendo. Please. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so he's really important. He's really important to human society. And he, he did a lot of things. And this is why um, I feel like we're going to be looping back around to Elden John because Elden John actually shares quite a bit in common with Hermes Trismegistus. But um, Let's keep going. We're going to keep going. So another thing that happened during Interpretatio Greca is that, like I mentioned before, there were a bunch of other legends that were taken from Egyptian mythology and applied to other, um, you know, to Greek culture. But at the same time, there were also beliefs and practices that also utilized things like trees and other stuff like that. And there was a lot of comparative mythology that started to happen during this time. Um, and there's a really cool story about a lady inside of a tree who gives you a drink of water before you go to the afterlife, and this tree is protected by this cat with a sword, um, who fights a snake to prevent the eclipse. There's a lot, there's a lot of really cool stories that we see in a western lens in Elden Ring. I love it. I love this little Watchdog Guardian reference to Ra protecting the roots of the Erd Tree. I love 
that Marika is a woman in the tree and she has a little she has a little cup of something for you. I don't know if it's water, could be could be sap. You don't know. But she wants you to take a sip. And that's really cool. I love that. Um something interesting though is that even though Marika was like a pagan idol, she married effectively the the Odin the Odin symbolism, the Odin symbol. Like she married Odin. This girl married Odin. Um, but she started to develop a fear about paganism. Um, and this is manifesting in a bunch of different ways in the game. So first off, her tree that she's supposed to be like the pagan god of stops producing sap. And uh-oh, you know, we once thought that the tree was immortal and that the blessed tree of the of the or the blessed sap of the earth tree would drip forever, but that age came swiftly to a close. Um, it was only for a fleeting moment, such as the course of all life. And then it talks about how it just became a object of faith as opposed to an actual divine entity. Um, and in large part, this has to do with the Erd tree dying. The age of the Erd tree is coming to a close. So Queen Marika says, I don't like that. That doesn't sound fun. I hate that. In fact, I want it to not end. Um, there is a prophecy that's in Norse mythology about Ragnarok, um, where the fire giants are supposed to come down and burn the tree, like burn the, tr the, the world tree, the, the, these guys, these guys are supposed to come down with their fire and they're supposed to come and they're supposed to burn Yggdrasil. And the reason why they're supposed to burn Yggdrasil is that there was this belief that Yggdrasil was rotting, like it's dead. It's time to burn it. Time to bring in the new age. Let's go. Um, but it seems like anybody, any prophet in the capital that would have these prophecies of the Erd tree burning would get exiled from the capital. They weren't having it. They were like, fuck you, get out. Like, you're not allowed to say that. The tree isn't coming to an end. Fuck you. And then the fire monks also went up um, to keep the fire giants in check once Queen Marika won the war against the fire giants. So Godfrey and Marika fought the fire giants. Um, and then in addition to fire being demonized as the corrupt god of flame, the death birds are also depicted as a malevolent deity. And also the misbegotten go from being seen as holy to being seen as an impurity. And then the omen start getting called ill omens or ill-fated omens. Um, there's the seedbed curse. There's all this weird stuff that's starting to happen. And then there's the genocide of the Great Caravan, where um, they're buried alive for their heretical beliefs. So there's something that actually happened in history that reflects this transition of power between pagan animistic belief systems and a monotheistic um, religion. And this would be specifically like regarding Constantine and Charlemagne. Um, there's a bunch of other rulers throughout Western history that demonized paganism or hurt other cultures or hurt groups of people and i want to make a point at this point in my video essay about how i don't feel that like obviously okay so here's the thing i have a lot of people who are christian or orthodox in the chat and um you know there's a there's a fine difference between like charlemagne wasn't popular with the orthodox belief system charlemagne was a fucking asshole um but the fact of the matter is you know even if you have a spiritual belief um, and it's it's largely good. There's also bad things that that are kind of like in tandem with that. Um, my own belief system is also like a part of this too, where you know you have to you can recognize the positive cultural things that have impacted your life or people around you, but there's also all the really awful negative shit. And um, the suppression of paganism and other belief systems was a huge one. And something that I find really awful about all of this um is that queen marika is sleeping in the fucking pantheon she's treating a ritual chamber that was used for polytheistic religions as her fucking bedroom she's sleeping in there that's her bed she she put like a bed in here and she was like night night this is my bedroom like what the fuck girl i can hate you i hate you <laughs> You're the worst. Anyway, um, so Goldmask calls her out on this shit. He's like, fuck you. Um, you know, I see through your shit. You're fickle. You're garbage. You're trash. Whatever. 
Um, and, you know, you have to be okay with your mortality. I think that something that's really interesting with the ancestral followers and with Eldon John's acceptance of death is that it's suggesting something that immortality doesn't have to be um, a signifier of the divine. In fact, mortality can be a signifier of the divine. The cycle of life and death can be a signifier of the divine. So even though the Erd tree has an end date or an expiration date, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not godly. In fact, it's like its connection to nature and um, as we see with the shamanistic cultures, that makes it such a spiritual experience. I'm sure that a lot of you can relate to this, but when I walked into the ancestral spirits boss room and I heard that violin kick in and I saw that deer float through the air and, and uh, suck up the souls of the bunnies down below, I definitely felt like I was having a spiritual experience. <laughs> Sorry if that's a little weird, but it's true. I felt that way. And when I stepped into the Elden Beast's room and I saw him move around like a little whale and I heard the choir singing in the background, that was also a really spiritual experience. Um, and I think that sometimes when we try to control nature, that's where things tend to go wrong. And I feel like this is where I, this is kind of like where I feel that Elden Ring has a lot in common with Bloodborne in that there's this theme of transcendence, specifically transcending mortality, transcending humanity, or transcending knowledge. Um, instead of appreciating the natural flow of life and death and the creatures on this planet. Um, and it's interesting because we actually see the continuation of this throughout human history, especially with the Enlightenment period, which I feel like I can make a whole ass video on. SMB is also making a video on this, um, along with the Meiji era and like a bunch of other stuff that we talked about. Isaac Newton got really into something called the Lumen Naturae, which is an alchemical um, ideology that, or ideology, what am I talking about? A thing that is in alchemy. So let me fucking back it up real quick. So Hermes Trismegistus created this like green emerald tablet that has esoteric secrets to mankind and life and spirituality and how to turn the soul into gold, how to turn metals into gold, unalloyed gold. So it's both a metaphysical or a spiritual doctrine, but it's also like an actual recipe that's hidden in some kind of secret code through a series of cross-cultural symbols. And there were a ton of movements during the Enlightenment period dedicated to deciphering this and to reviving this kind of like esoteric spirituality or mysticism. And it gets kind of wrapped up in, um, you know, there's like Jewish mysticism, there's Christian mysticism, and there's actually um, Isaac Newton is like a really big dude in a... Uh, in, in this kind of movement of science, early science, but also of magic and spirituality and, and all this other stuff. And he was actually a follower of the Rosicrucian movement, which was um, also known as the Rosy Church. And sure enough, the man who is looking into Luminatre, the light that is in the darkness, or, um, you know, trying to observe comets, trying to observe phenomena that's, na that's uh, invisible to the naked eye, um, you know, he's studying this out of fucking Raya Lucaria right outside where the Rose Church is at. Um, and by he, I'm talking about Azur, the man who studied comets in Elden Ring. Um, and it's also no coincidence that uh, the Alabaster Lords hang out in Raya Lucaria, or one of the Alabaster Lords, um, and knows gravitational magic. So there's kind of like this whole theme with the Enlightenment movement that SMB and I talked about regarding Isaac Newton and um, kind of like his placement in, in the uh, Elden Ring world, but it's it's extra funny that Vare is a Rosicrucian because the Rosicrucians, even though, you know, they started off as just like a Christian mysticism movement, um, also spawned a series of death cults, which I feel like Vare is kind of partaking in, which is silly, but that's not where the alchemical um, symbolism ends, right? Uh, Zeostorm had a whole video on alchemy and the Red King and the White Queen and the journey on achieving the Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone, like I mentioned, is a thing that um, prevents illness, um, grants immortality, and creates unalloyed gold, which is a common theme, especially with Mikola. Um, Mikola is looking to save his sister, somebody who's cursed with rot, um, but Melania is also going through her own 
uh, inner alchemy at the time. So while Mikola embodies the journey of the Philosopher's Stone and what's called the conjunction child or a child that is born of the, the, the king and the queen, um, this child is both male and female intersex. Mikola has St. Trina. Mikola is depicted both as a boy and a girl. Um, and then also, uh, you know, there's like the story of the two-headed dragon, also known as the stone dragon. Stone dragon is absolutely in reference to, even though he was a four-headed dragon originally, symbolically, the two heads, one is facing the sun, one is facing the moon, and they're intertwined, um, has a lot to do with how gold is being processed um, through gravel via mercury. Um, I'll make another video about this another time but it has a lot to do with Mikola's storyline and how we're able to cure ourselves of the, uh, of the, the shit, the, what's it called? The frenzied flame. But a lot of it has to do with gravel and amalgam, which I'll get, I'll, I'll make a video on that. It was really toxic and bad for the environment, by the way. It was really fucking awful. Um, so yeah, Mercury is our albinorix, um, Quicksilver. It's associated with the moon. Um, and then the sun would be gold um, or sulfur, depending depending on the context. So this is all Mikola imagery, right? Well, Melania is on the other end of the spectrum. In fact, she has a teacher who is from the East. And there's a lot of Eastern um, philosophy and religion that's occurring in Elden Ring too. But it's a little bit more into the surface and I didn't notice it at first until SMB made a point to, to talk to me about it. Um, I'm not going to get into everything that we talked about. Obviously, they're going to make a video on it, but um, there's a lot about Taoist or Taoist um, philosophy and Confucianism that lends itself to The Secret of the Golden Flower, a Taoist book on inner alchemy, specifically Eastern alchemy um, that mixes Buddhist teachings with Confucian thoughts. And the idea is that we have three flowers of the mind and we need to bloom the three flowers for example melania blooming three times um which represents the unification of the spirit the breath and the essential matter or body um and there are five aspects of something called shen and the five aspects <clears throat> in uh taoist theory one's mind expression energy spirit or deity lend to an understanding that the psyche contains five fundamental parts and interdependent parts. Often known as the collective five spirits, they are described respectively as awareness, willpower, intellect, animal nature, and human nature. So something super important to keep in mind is that Millicent is one of the five aspects of Melania. And she talks about this. She actually says that she has something that she has to return to Melania, the will that was once her own. So Millicent represents one of the five um, aspects of Melania that is her will. And I find it really interesting because Drakengard, for your near fans out there, also uses this imagery of zero in the center and the five sisters that, um, you know, are kind of like making up each aspect of her being. And um, I feel like this imagery is, is one to one with, uh, with Melania. I feel like you fight four sisters, but you fight the four sisters with her fifth sister, Millicent. So she has the five siblings that are all kind of like placed around her. Um, and there's all these like opportunities for her to bloom, for her mind, her body, and her essential breath to bloom. Um, and so between the combination of Mikola and Melania, um, I don't know why I said Mikola and Millicent, Mikola and Melania, um, <laughs> Through the combination of the two of them, we have a tree of life that's growing from Mikola, and we have the flower of life that's growing from Melania. And if you actually take a look, um, we're in the drainage channel here. I did this on my stream last night. This is um, where the rot pool, where you do Millicent's quest line. There's a bunch of rot that's pouring into the Melania's boss room. This is Melania's boss room where you fight her. And if you actually go down there, you can notice that by the time that the water, the poison, the rot is being drained into the boss room, the water down here is purified and it actually doesn't do rot damage to you. Um, in fact, 
it seems like both Mikola and Melania have ascended to become philosopher's stones or materials that are able to um, transcend or purify objects. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit too. I mentioned before about how there's a Buddhist teaching about the lotus flower and rot, where um, in order for a lotus flower to bloom, it uses the nutrients from the rot and it actually rises above rot and death and entropy in order to become this like really vivid flower and the symbol of enlightenment or the symbol of, of achieving enlightenment above this body of stagnant water. And that's why her teacher represents flowing water is there's this combination between the stagnant and the flowing water. Um, there's this really beautiful Buddhist teaching I've talked about in the past regarding that. But um, in addition to the Brahma Lotus, which I feel like the Scarlet Aeonia is based off of, we also have the chrysanthemums or the symbols of the golden flower um, and a lot of uh, Taoist alchemy. Another really interesting thing too is that in the secret of the golden flower there's a lot of these teachings that are combined with um acupuncture teachings which acupuncture was believed to purify and revitalize uh people so the needles that are used in melania and millicent's quest line along with the flowers and all this other stuff is definitely things that are are having to do with the purification of of uh you know the rot. It's really interesting too. I think, um, you know, you have a character, Melania, who's able to produce absorbent amount, absorbent amounts of rot, but then you have the character Mikola, who's able to purify that rot to create celestial or pure water. Um, so they almost created a self-sustaining system down here. But it seems like with the disturbance of Mikola, Moog, you know stole the Philosopher's Stone or Michaela's Kaloon or Kaloon <laughs> Michaela's Cocoon, the Philosopher's Egg, there we go um, and takes it to the Mogwin Dynasty um, ruins, which like I, I'm struggling to find the words because like it's tragic, right? But another thing that I find tragic is that even though it seems like Mikola and Melania are successful, the misbegotten are still standing outside of the Halig tree praying to be reborn. And so this is where I start to like question the pursuit of unalloyed gold. While I really do love Melania and Mikola as characters, they're, they're two of my favorites, and I like to think that they were successful in achieving enlightenment and finding peace, there's a part of me that finds discomfort in knowing or feeling that beings who are tied to nature and the natural world and, you know, the nature of life and death and all this other stuff are wishing to be changed. It makes me feel uncomfortable and it almost reminds me, this purification process almost reminds me of eugenics in a way, of purging things deemed undesirable in order to make pure gold or this fascination with like ascending um, and everything being of the same you know, material. And I don't like that. That idea doesn't sit well with me. It makes me really uncomfortable. And I think that's actually intentional. I think that's why the misbegotten are treated so poorly. And it's something we're supposed to reflect on. We're supposed to reflect on the lament, um, the pain and the suffering of the beast people. You know, there's like a bit of, of spirituality with the natural world that's dying um, while some of these other spiritualities are flourishing. And perhaps maybe there's some kind of balance we could reach. I know with my own spirituality, um, you know, I was raised Christian and Catholic, and then my one of my grandparents is potentially Jewish, um, but abandoned faith upon fleeing Poland. Um, and something that I, I wonder about frequently is, um, you know, with uh, Franciscan Catholicism, which is what my grandma practices, focuses on a story about the wolf of Kabul, or Kabul? Is it Kabul? Um, there's a wolf. <laughs> there's a wolf, and that wolf used to terrorize this small village, and um, used to, like, kill and, and eat people. And St. Francis's, uh, like, I guess, like, solution for dealing with the problem is to feed the wolf and then the wolf becomes a comrade or um, you become an equal with the wolf and the wolf also learns to protect um, you and and you're kind of like seen as 
I don't know, like a part of part of nature. There's like some kind of there's some kind of like relationship with nature to some degree. And at first when I was a kid, I thought this was like a metaphoric union, like you feed people who are hurtful to you or you you try to rise above, you know, suffering or when people treat you poorly, you, you, you just show kindness. I thought that it was like a metaphor, or like a teaching regarding that. But they actually found a fucking wolf skeleton in one of the churches that this that this uh, Franciscan story came from. <laughs> so it was like this weird appreciation for like natural life. And there were a lot of Christian groups throughout um, parts of Ireland and Scotland and parts of Scandinavia that were, um, you know, still had some degree of pagan beliefs. Um, it was funny, I was talking to my stream chat about this recently, about how, like, scary looking into neo-paganism is, because, um, on one degree, it sounds very nice. Like, I would love to unify spirituality and accept death and accept, um, entropy and accept the cycle of, like, thermodynamics and stuff. Like, I love that. But then there's all these, like, really awful white supremacist groups that have started to, like, uh, you know occupy those spaces and it's a little bizarre but um it's interesting it's the whole conversation around unalloyed gold and western purification and immortality and um you know monotheism and and this whole trajectory of human history and spirituality is so interesting to me um and i hope that y'all find it interesting too i know that there's a lot of um you know uh catholics or christians or orthodox you know peeps who might feel differently about uh, these conclusions. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Isaac Newton too later. So apologies if I didn't cover like every every kind of belief system. I was primarily focusing on the form of Christianity that took place um, after Charlemagne's rule. So the form of Christianity that was, uh, you know, in the west of the Great Schism. Um, so there's like the east and the west. Western Roman Empire, which is occupied by the Goths, the Germanic Scandinavian peeps, um, that would be Godfrey and all, all that stuff. And then the Eastern would be for Missoula and um, that belief system. So yeah. Woo! -hoo! Love to see it. Love to see it. Anyway, that's my video essay. It's 40 minutes. Thank you all for tuning in. I just rambled a lot and mispronounced a lot and probably, you know, Whatever. Okay. Love you. Bye.